this is our second panel on uh, the Internet of Things. For folks who came to our session in May, you know, we talked a lot about developments and the like. This is really going to help us focus on M&A um, and financing and how the IoT impacts both of those things. So. Uh, without further ado, Chris Resendez uh, from Inex Advisors. Chris, um, I have heard speak uh, and uh, have spoken with him uh, a number of times on this topic. And when you speak to Chris, you understand that he knows uh, and can share more in about one minute uh, than most of us will learn uh, in, a, in a year about the IoT. Chris uh, and his team at Inex Advisors are focused on helping clients define, select, and prosecute their most promising growth and investment opportunities. His firm concentrates in machine-to-machine, -machine, Internet of Things connected devices uh, and how, um, how those are going to impact uh, businesses, large and small. So, Chris, why don't you kick us off and then, um, well, I'll, uh, I'll give you the, the, the sign. We can sit down and continue the conversation. Chris Larry, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's good. I've never taught a class, so that's awesome. <clears throat> um, I'm not a very formal guy. I'm going to be honest with you, straight up bluff, bottom line up front. I'm not a very formal person, um, but I'm a very caring person. So I'm going to try to make sure that every word that I speak with you this morning is valuable. And I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about companies that we've worked with. I won't use names or companies that we've grown um, to participate in this thing called the Internet of Things. So with that, um, we, look, language matters, right? So I'm going to share my language and I'll define it for you. We call it the instrumentation of the physical world. Sounds highfalutin, but it's not. There are physical assets, physical inventories, and physical areas of operation or operating environments that right now are dark. There's no sensor, there's no controller, there's no computer on, in, or near that asset, that inventory, or that AO, area of operation. Yet, the vast majority of your enterprises are digitized. Then you've got these trillions of dollars in physical assets, inventories, and AO, area of operation, and they don't show up anywhere in your digital systems. Now, individuals, otherwise known as consumers, I don't like the word, so I don't use it. You'll understand why by the end of this session. Individuals, small and mid-sized enterprises, Fortune 500, government organizations, and NGOs are all dependent upon the state, the status, the location, the health, the utilization, the optimization of all those physical assets. And yet, they're dark. And so for us, we think that's the best, biggest way to talk about it. Uh, there's a company called Hawaiian Heritage Hardwood in Hawaii. They are doing, as you might imagine, harvesting heritage hardwood in Hawaii. <laughs> and they have a shrinkage problem. Early on in the life of that business, that sustainable lumber business, that exotic hardwood lumber business, they were experiencing beautiful, wonderful saplings were being uprooted, and 10 or 12 year growth timber was being cut down. So they put very small sensors in the bases of the trunks of those trees. And they did some health and, health and wellness monitoring, temperature, moisture, and perhaps some chemistry. But they also had an acoustic sensor, and there was also a shock and vibration sensor, otherwise known as a gyroscope. So if a tree falls in a nursery and no one's there to hear it, you've got a sensor. So if someone rips a cord on a chainsaw in an attempt to harvest one of your trees, that acoustic sensor will pick up that noise signature and excite the radio, the wireless radio in the sensor, send a signal to whomever you want that signal to go to, to you, to your night manager, to the local authorities, and perhaps before the tree gets cut down, a light can go on, or an alert, or an alarm can go off, or somebody can be dispatched or deployed to the nursery to stop that illegal harvesting. But what if someone uses an ax, and they strike the tree once, first time, huge shock and vibration moment for that sensor, same thing happens. Does that make sense? Okay. So that tree is a physical asset. We'd call it a living asset. It's alive, or a natural resource asset. And that sensor is the IoT device. And whatever the wireless network is, honestly, folks, is almost irrelevant. But the fact is the data is going somewhere. It's being processed on the sensor a little bit. And maybe it's being processed more in the cloud. That, too, is irrelevant at the end of the day. Your application will determine where you should have your intelligence and where you should have your processing. But the key is 
It creates new data, new intelligence, new value. And the question is, how you close that loop? Now that you know something is happening at the tree, what do you do about it? You send the alert or the alarm to a human. You send the alert or the alarm to another machine. That machine could be the light that starts to flicker. It could be an alarm or a blast horn to try and scare that poacher. Or maybe it's just a small message to you on your smartphone. I tell you that story so that maybe I can expand your thinking a little bit about the Internet of Things. It is not just about the smart or connected home. It is not just about Industry 4.0 or the next generation of industrial automation and control in a factory. It is not just about the connected car. And it sure as hell isn't just only about the smart city. Any part of the physical world that matters, that truly matters, can be and should be instrumented, and it can be and should be connected, and it can be and should be managed however you like to manage your assets or your operations for more profitability, for more utilization, for more stability, sustainability, and access. And now I just went off the reservation a little bit, right? Because I'm not talking about revenue. And I'm not talking about cost reduction or cost management. The power of instrumenting certain assets goes far beyond the traditional definitions of financial success in most balance sheets or general accounting principles. I'll tell you a second story. A company called Grunfoss is one of the largest water pump builders in the world. They have perhaps 700 or 750 million water pumps deployed on the planet Earth. That's a remote asset, and it's fixed. But it's outside walls, it's outside fences. Most of those pumps are in the developing world inside some, a place that you would call an austere environment. No consistent control of the physical environment, no consistent power, and no consistent communications. Austere. Point two, most of the customers in frontier markets or less developed regions don't really have the capital to buy the pump. So Grunfuss has created water as a service. You hear about you know, anything as a service. Well, imagine water as a service. Instead of selling the pump and receiving revenue, they're now deploying the pump and they're taking revenue on an ongoing basis. In other words, water as a service requires a service level agreement. How much water is being pushed out of the pump determines how much revenue Grunfoss collects. Here's the kicker. You sell the pump, you have your revenue. The pump goes down, if it's under warranty, you assume a liability. If it's not under warranty, you now have another revenue generating event. But under an SLA for water, if that pump goes down, you're not getting paid. And you're assuming a cost basis or a cost event. So they went and deployed the Internet of Things. Put a small sensor on the pump to basically just pull a couple of pieces of data off the pump. Is the pump running, like ignition, on or off? What's the tachometer speed? Maybe some vibration, maybe some temperature. But basic indicators that the pump is running and the pump is pushing water. So guess what? We have digital documentation that we can send the invoice for the water that we pushed out of the pump. Factor three. Man, can you think about the breadth, the regional or geographic coverage of water pumps in a place like the Horn of Africa? You have to put boots in trucks and trucks on site to repair or manage or monitor any of those pumps. So they deployed IoT so that they could keep the pumps running, so they could collect their revenue, and so that they could do something called route optimization. This is one of the killer apps in IoT. If you have widely dispersed or broadly deployed assets, you want to make sure that you're not spending a nickel to visit an asset that doesn't need a human to attend to it. If the pump's running and is pushing clean water and you're compliant with your SLA, you don't want anyone to visit that pump. They did this, massive gains in productivity, Massive gains in asset utilization, optimization, revenue, all the good stuff happened financially. But they went further, and this is why I'm telling you the story. And they started thinking, and the question we love is, well, now what? Or then what? We have this data, we have this intelligence, we're deploying it for route optimization and having multiple vectors and levels of financial return. It's brilliant, we love it. Product development's using it, engineering is using it, it's just, Massive internal enterprise value. But one of the people that we love at Grunfoss says, I have an idea. Let's pursue this open data concept with a slice or a sliver of the intelligence that we've collected. Now imagine you've got thousands of pumps, hundreds of thousands of pumps deployed in the Horn of Africa, and they're all pushing data up through a 2G cellular connection, up into the cloud, 
data is arriving at your network operating center somewhere in Central Europe? And the, the answer was, we could probably pinch some of the data, create a little SMS, simple messaging service application, that can be consumed by an old, ratty feature phone or flip phone, not the full up, you know, four-way processor, Galaxy S5, but the old ratty flip phones, which is the device that most people in the frontier markets carry. It's not an iPhone. And here's what they gave them. The same basic capability to manage their pursuit of water that we use to pursue Starbucks. <laughs> Where is there a pump near me? Is that pump on? Is that pump pushing water? Is the water clean? And by harvesting the GPS signals from the other feature phone users of that service, you get an estimate of how long you might have to wait to get your water out of that pump. They gave that away for free. That was not charitable. That was not philanthropy. That was brilliant. Because they took the time to water for the average family in those areas of operation down from eight hours per day to three and a half hours per day. Now imagine what a human living in or around a subsistence environment like that can do with 4.5 hours per day. Heal sores, heal sprained ankles, recover from the flu, learn something more beyond subsistence farming, maybe get some greater degree of formal education. But at the end of the day, the four and a half hours becomes human capital that gets deployed to create, guess what, at the end of the day? Greater demand for water and water pumps and water as a service. So I tell you that story because when you think about the value creation opportunities from the Internet of Things, yes, Imelt is, he's absolutely correct. I was with him at the Colorado Innovation Network Summit at the end of August. He gave the keynote and I followed right after him. And his point, no downtime, zero downtime, is perfect as a starting point. But it is absolutely not the end of the value creation for something like the Internet of Things. I give you those two cases, to hopefully, to expand your mind a little bit. Now I dive in. If your business is a physical product business, whether it's industrial or infrastructure, commercial or retail products, physical products, and you are not considering how you can instrument or embed connectivity or intelligence into those products, you must start yesterday. Now notice the language. I'm not saying you have to connect your products, but you have to at least start asking the question. Because if your customers, notice I started with your customers, not your operation. If your customers can achieve greater value against their goals with your products being connected and instrumented, you will win. The most successful companies in the world in IoT today start with the customer value proposition. Let me be clear. They do not start with their ability to harvest data about their customers or about their products. Clearly, Porter's a genius. I should not even be using his name. Clearly, Heppelman and the crew at PTC are brilliant. I have a lot of confidence in their ability to make amazing things happen. However, it is not about capturing, it's not about creating and capturing value only. It's about creating, capturing, and enabling. It is fear that drives many industrial companies to want to hyper-concentrate that data for themselves. It is fear that is causing other commercial or retail or hospitality companies to want to hyper-concentrate that capital as well. We're living this right now in the off-road heavy equipment space, iNexus. We're the firm that has helped the Association of Equipment Management Professionals, those companies that manage big fleets, figure out how they can get more of the data that comes off of their asset. Quick story. If you own a bulldozer or lease a bulldozer, it shows up on your balance sheet in many different ways. It's a critical component, it's a critical asset for you to build time, to book business and to deliver on a schedule and a budget, some scope of work statement. But for the, most of the 20 years of that bulldozer's life, as data is streaming off that bulldozer, gigabytes of data streaming off that bulldozer, you don't own it, Caterpillar does. And not just Caterpillar, every major manufacturer of heavy equipment has maintained over the past 20 years that the data that comes off your bulldozer is theirs. Now, any of you that manage those kinds of assets know that the data or the device intelligence that comes off that asset represents operational intelligence. It could represent intellectual property. So to me, it's illogical that an OEM of an asset 
the OEM of the asset, should own the device intelligence from the asset that I own. That's going to break down. And we're helping them break it down intelligently to help manage risk for the OEMs and to help create more value for the asset owners, the asset operators. So the story I tell you there is this. If you think that you can instrument your products or your physical services and not share or trade some of that data with your customers, you will lose. So on the one hand, I'm telling you you've got to look at it. On the other hand, I'm telling you, you're not going to get to Facebook the physical world. You're not going to get to Google all those gigabytes of data that are coming off of your customers' operations. Second story, last story, well, fourth story, last uh, second case I'll leave you with is this. Uh, we're involved with <clears throat> a number of startups. Some of them we've helped create, others we've simply helped finance, and others we only advise. But one of the things that we try to do with them is take them through this process. And, and the process is about the data. Okay, you've got a startup, <clears throat> and I see Joe Caruso here, and we share a small interest in PetNet with you, sir. And we worked with the folks at PetNet for years, more than a year before they entered the Bolt Hardware Accelerator program. And Carlos Herrera and I shared some past lives in unmanned aerial vehicles. He was doing sensor attestation and certification and onboard sensors on the birds, and I was doing work ingesting that data on smartphones for intelligence and special operations forces that were dismounted in those austere environments. So we had some history, had high degrees of trust, and what we talked about was, man, a lot of people are doing this smart pet feeder. Everyone wants to do something with pets. Why I believe PetNet will be successful, in full disclosure, we have a small position in that cap table, is that they focused on a couple of things. The first one was, what data are you really going to produce from pet food? And they did the work to understand a concept I call fulcrum data. What is the data that really matters? Because if you listen to too many wireless companies and too many machine cloud vendors, they'll tell you, capture it all. We'll figure it out later. But Carlos and his crew weren't satisfied with that. They identified what the fulcrum data is. I'm not going to tell you what the fulcrum data is. I'll leave that to Carlos. But the fact is, they have a level of granularity and resolution on the value of pet food, nutritionally and financially, that has not been developed before. But that is not transparent to the customers, to the pet owners. They don't need to know that. All they need to know is that their animal is going to eat exactly what they should eat, no more, no less. And that if that can happen consistently on a date and time basis, that that animal will be healthier physically, will be healthier emotionally, will be more trainable, will live a longer life, and will actually, at the end of the day, drive less expense or cost for the pet owner to manage that pet. All kinds of great things. But what he focused on was what data really? You know, can you, a handful. I feed my dog two handfuls a day. Why is he getting fat? What are you feeding him? I'll leave that there. The second thing we did was to say, okay, what could we do with this data? It's not just about the pet owner. There are other stakeholders that have an interest in the wellness of that animal, have financial interests in the wellness of the animal. Now, I give you this one because this is hard not to smirk at. But if you have instrumentation on the food that that animal is eating, who else would care about it? That's the question. Who else cares? So we worked with Carlos on that. And we found out that, well, Maybe vets, maybe pet food companies, maybe pet supply companies, maybe pet walkers, maybe pet insurance companies. But try this at home, folks. And I'll leave you with this, my fifth and final point. If you are thinking about investing in an IoT startup, if you are thinking about investing in instrumentation of the assets or the operations in your own business, I would ask you to do this. Define that asset brutally, clearly, coldly. What is it? Number one. Number two, what value does it create for whom? So we call it a honeycomb model. Just imagine, put the asset in the middle of your little map and just start to map all of the stakeholders who would care about where that asset is, how healthy that asset is, is that asset running, is that asset sucking cost or creating value? And I guarantee you will find that it's more than the asset owner and more than the asset OEM. There will be many other stakeholders who could achieve benefit create value from getting access to, let me be clear now, some of the data. I'm not talking about shareware. I'm not talking about open data. I'm not talking about giving it away. I'm not talking about freemium. What I'm talking about is this. 
Whatever you instrument is going to produce a ton of data, but that data is not a big monolithic bit pipe. It's not an all or nothing proposition. It's not like Netflix, rent the movie or buy the movie, okay? It's not like Netflix. It's like this. There are 100 people in the room, and you all have different favorite scenes from Superman. So let's split the room. Your favorite scenes are when he's flying. Your favorite scenes are when he's with Lois Lane. Now you have two different bit pipes, right? You have the whole movie to rent or the whole movie to buy. Now you have just the scenes where he's flying and just the scenes where he's with Lois Lane. But then half of this group says, I want to edit those scenes because I want to share it with my kids and they're not all appropriate. Now you have another set of subscriptions. And then take another section of the people who just want Superman with Lois Lane, but they want to be able to edit it, and they also want to get rights so that they can publish it for fee. That's how you should be thinking about the value creation opportunity in the data. Because when people talk about big data, the value isn't in the lake. The value is in the splinters and the slices and the threads. It's not in the big fat bit pipes. I hope this was interesting. I hope it's what Larry was hoping for. Terrific. And I hope when you think about IoT, you think more broadly than just machined or manufactured branded products. And you think about something more than just money for your customer or for yourself. Because there's a big world of people out there who need just a little bit of data. And if you're controlling it, I think you can monetize it. So. What a great start. Chris, thank you.